Kapu goige, everybody. Good day. My language, Kalalago Ya, uh, as uh, Ani Roz so, um, said so well. Uh, Karareg Kalkagal and Erebamle is my mob. Um, and uh, But I'm born and bred on Larakia country in Darwin. That's where I've always lived. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Uluru Statement from the Heart. I want you to understand uh, where this referendum has come from, why we are at this moment in time. And I think the most powerful words um, that I've heard in a long time was Ani Roz saying, um, there's no excuse big enough not to move forward. Uh, and I think that really frames this talk uh, really well. Um, because there's been a massive amount of hard work that has gone into this opportunity that all Australians will have, I think it'll be mid-October the referendum. Um, it's no longer a debate about whether or not we have a referendum to enshrine a voice in the constitution. It's happening. We have a government committed to that. Uh, and, um, and I'll explain why it is more than symbolism that we're doing, but uh, something substantive uh, and important to health. The work that you guys do, the very important work that you do. Um, but to do that, I'll, I'll talk about how I understand it. I'll, I'll give context to it. I was a wharfie for 16 years. Uh, from when I was 17 years old. I was on the wharf uh, in 1998, if you remember the Patrick's dispute, some of you might remember it. It's when they, uh, Patrick Stevedores, one of the two big stevedores around the country, wharfy country, uh, companies, um, basically physically dragged us out of our livelihoods on the wharves across the country in collusion with John Howard and the National Farmers Federation. Uh, Howard was the prime minister at the time. Uh, I got a great understanding of unity when I was on the wharf, not just the word that you say, you know, more than a word, just that you say in a forum like this or at a rally, um, but actually the leverage that unity provides, the, the structure that's required, uh, the discipline, the accountability of your leaders, um, uh, you know, um, the resources with which to reach consensus regularly and to uh, to, to forward, take forward the interests of the people that are to be united. Um, and uh, that was uh, an important uh, period of my life um, because I saw uh, just how important it was to have that structure to uh, defend um, the things that our, we had achieved as Wharfies over a long period of time, our union. Um, I was very proud to be uh, a Wharfie and, and getting through that Patrick's dispute and walking back into the gates some months later um, and, uh, and protecting our voice, you know, our union was the voice of maritime workers, um, was one of the reasons why I was really proud to be a Wharfie. I mean, I worked with fellas that uh, had been a part of taking um, supplies down to the Gurindji people during the Gurindji Wayfield walk-off. I just mentioned some of these uh, actions of solidarity that our union had taken with Indigenous peoples um, that, that taught me so much about the importance of uh, a voice. Um, the Gurindji Wavehill walk-off was in 1966, and if anyone doesn't know about that, it was 200 Aboriginal stock workers and domestics uh, and their families that walked off Wavehill Station um, for equal wages initially, and the uh, MUA, the Maritime Union of Australia, the Waterside Workers Federation back then, uh, was one of the first to react and, and take supplies down there for nine years, that struggle went for. And um, those workers, and this, this is something to keep in mind here, those workers, they say they were paid in rations, a bit of beef bone, some flour, some sugar and tea, uh, they worked 16 hour days, they had no time for recreation. They had no time to bury their dead with dignity. Um, it wasn't just working for rations. If you're only getting the sustenance you need to work such incredible hours and you have no time for anything else really, um, then that's slavery. And so they walked off in protest against slavery and it became a struggle for land rights. And it culminated in uh, when Gough Whitlam became the prime minister traveled to Gurindji country, and many of you are familiar with the iconic image of Gough uh, pouring a handful of sand into the leader of the Gurindji people, Vincent Lingari's hand, uh, giving some land back. Um, I'll digress. The Gurindji people are great supporters of this campaign, uh, a constitutionally enshrined voice to parliament, because 
that moment is, is a moment that deserved celebration. It was courageous, the Gurindji people, and there was great solidarity around the country to achieve that. Um, and, uh, and it was an incredible feat. But what happened after Gurindji people had some land back is they set up a mining company and a cattle business and they suffered from the paternalism they suffered from sabotage, particularly from the country Liberal Party, a, a, a very racist uh, party in them days. It was um, uh, their members were part of the Rights for Whites rallies in Catherine, near Gurindji country there. Uh, and and uh, regulations and laws that were um, that that um, really uh, were not were, were making the Gurindji way of, of wanting to live and and to enjoy their beef, um, to live on the land and to practice their culture. Vincent Lingari's dream was to live on their land their way. And what the Gurindji people learnt, because eventually the cattle company and the mining company were, um, uh, were destroyed really, um, is that it is one thing to have your land back, but it's another thing you need to be able to influence the laws and policies that control how you live on your land and how you're able to enjoy it. So they're great supporters of this campaign. The 1940s as well was another struggle, the 1946 Pilbara strike. And Aboriginal workers on pastoral stations across the Pilbara walked off, um, again for equal wages, and wharfies and seafarers refused to um, export the cargoes from those pastoral stations in solidarity with those workers and help them to achieve greater pay and conditions. Uh, the 1920s, the first all Aboriginal political organisation, they say, was the Aboriginal, uh, Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association. And the leader of that was a guy named Fred Maynard, a Warramai man, and he was a wharfie, and undoubtedly had the support of his fellow workers, his union. So these things made me really proud to be a, a union member. Um, I became an official of the union in 2010, and I'm still an official. And it's a union that has supported me to do the work that I've done for the last six years. There were no resources in this campaign after the Uluru Statement came out and was almost immediately dismissed by the Turnbull government. And I became involved because Arnie Pat Anderson, who you'd know of, a great leader in health in particular for Aboriginal people, uh, Professor Megan Davis, they went to my union and said, can we have Thomas um, to help us in what we need to do? And so I seconded to the movement not employed by the Referendum Council, not by the government, but just seconded to this movement to do what we knew was the right thing to do. When I became an official, I became uh, cognizant of the inefficiency or the ineffectiveness of our advocacy. I was organising protests in Darwin about the uh, disgraceful decisions that were being made, the harmful decisions uh, that were affecting our people. I'll mention a couple. The uh, 2015, you might remember the national protests around uh, Tony Abbott, cutting hundreds of millions of dollars from frontline services, affected health, uh, legal services, all those things, um, and led to the WA government announcing that they were gonna close down a whole lot of communities. Over a hundred communities would have been affected. Uh, disgraceful decision. Uh, and, and a contributor to the gap widening. Uh, the treatment of youth in detention. Some of you might remember the Four Corners report. I think it was 2016. Exposed the way that youth as young as 10 years old were being treated in the Don Dale facility in Darwin, a facility that's still open. Um, but organizing the protests around these things and noticing that this cycle of activism that when an injustice is fresh, we get great numbers on the streets, we can turn people out. Some of you might have been there in solidarity with our mob. But always the subsequent protests, the subsequent actions, less numbers. It's hard to keep people turning out. It's hard to maintain the rage. And the government has tools to diminish our momentum when we're fighting for our rights. We demand inquiries. And we get them sometimes. At best, we get royal commissions. But what happens is they take months or years. The recommendations come out in those reports. 
The anger is dissipated. The recommendations are not implemented. You'd know that very well in health. So, also, I notice how we can have five speakers on the stump at a rally, and we put forward 10 different solutions to one problem. There's a lack of coherency, this lack of structure. Um, there's a competition at times, and uh, you know, we were talking about it earlier, Arnie, you know how um, people can be chosen by political parties or choose themselves and say they speak for blackfellas today. And so all of these things really, uh, I noticed were um, causing our, our advocacy to be too ineffective. We're not making enough progress. And certainly the decision makers that uh, are making those harmful policies and laws, uh, uh, there's no repercussions, not politically, not legally. So I was looking for a way we could do things better. Uh, and along with many of our people in that time, and I was invited to a dialogue that happened in Darwin. It was one of 10, 12 regional dialogues around the country. It was the Referendum Council. And the Referendum Council came from the Kirribilli Statement. When 39 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders met with the Prime Minister and the opposition leader in 2015, and they said a couple of things uh, that are very important. Firstly, to the theme of this talk, they said, we don't want just symbolism when it comes to constitutional recognition. We want a form of constitutional recognition that is substantive, that will give our people greater fairness. And secondly, they said that to do this so that this conversation continues, we want a referendum council to be established to take the question to our people and to broader Australia about what form of constitutional recognition we could accept. So this dialogue was one of those. It was uh, a lead designer of these dialogues was Professor Megan Davis and Arnie Pat Anderson was the co-chair of the Referendum Council. And these dialogues were three days each. They were well informed. There was an intense lesson on civics for the participants. There was 100 participants at each around that, not to exclude anybody, but to ensure that there was a cross section of views, perspectives, experiences, not just the loudest of our people being heard in those dialogues like I was by then, but the quieter advocates, the healers, the people do the, that do the work that you interact with. Um, and that, that was an important part of these dialogues. There was also a, um, a history of the struggle. Rachel Perkins, world-class filmmaker, daughter of Charlie Perkins, a 20 minute film she made that took us through the other statements and petitions, the other aspirational moments, the promises made by prime ministers that were broken, all of those moments in history. Uh, they gave us, gave us a great understanding uh, of the lessons that we could learn from the past. And two final things happened at those dialogues at the end of the three days. There was a record of meeting that was put up before everybody, endorsed as accurate after amendments were needed. And they elected delegates, representatives to go to a culminating convention in the heart of the country at Uluru. And the job of the delegates was to take those records of meetings, have the debates and discussions in the heart of the country at Uluru, and, and try our best to reach a consensus on how we could walk forward together. I was elected out of the Darwin Dialogue. Uncle Jack R. Kitt, uh, some of you might know of, um, nominated me. He's passed on. He was a great leader in the Northern Territory uh, and nationally. Um, but we went to Uluru with great hope. There was 270 of us at Uluru, and it was tough. Come from many different places, uh, many different experiences, even political ideologies. And some of our people went there to protest before we even began. And on the second day, 20 of 270 walked out uh, in protest. Um, they had a different opinion to most of the people, and they tried to leverage that. That's normal politics. Right, 270 health workers and researchers in a room, you're gonna have different opinions. Same with our mob, we're not homogenous. Uh, but the rest of us, 250, continued the work. And on the third and final morning, um, we heard the Uluru Statement from the Heart read for the first time, after a whole lot of us had worked uh, through the night and, uh, and it was received with standing acclamation and tears of joy and hope. 
Now I'll recite the Uluru Statement from the Heart, and I hope you will feel what we felt that morning, 26 May 2017. We gathered at the 2017 National Constitutional Convention, coming from all points to the southern sky, make this statement from the heart. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did according to the reckoning of our culture from the creation, according to the common law from time immemorial and according to science more than 60,000 years ago. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion the ancestral tie between the land or mother nature and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom remain attached thereto and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil or better of sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished and it coexists with the sovereignty of the crown. How could it be otherwise? that a people's possessed the land for 60 millennia and this sacred link disappears from world history in merely the last 200 years? With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Proportionately, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our children are alien from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them. And our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish, they will walk in two worlds, and their culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Makarata is the culmination of our agenda, a coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth telling about our history. In 1967, we were counted. In 2017, we seek to be heard. We leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country. We invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. See your restatement. So they're powerful words. It was a powerful moment. It was a political feat that I think this country should celebrate forever. Um, our mob coming from so many different places around the country, doing the hard work and reaching a consensus. And I think if you ran the process again, because some people get stuck on the process and say, oh, you know, so-and-so wasn't invited and so-and-so wasn't invited. I mean, that's why that formula was important. And we came together and we did the hard work. We come up with, um, a proposal that is uh, both achievable and powerful. It calls for a constitutionally enshrined voice enshrined in the constitution because every time we as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have established a voice, even where we have convinced a benevolent government to do so, another government has come along and taken that voice away. And I briefly talked about the 1998 Patrick's dispute because I want to talk about ATSIC. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, set up under Hawke, opposed by Howard in opposition. And when Howard got into power, he used a similar strategy to when he tried to silence the voice of maritime workers and his plan was to go after the rest of the union movement. As a 20 year old Wolfie, I was wondering why in the media and in the parliament, Wolfies were being described as lazy, that our officials were described as corrupt, all of these things that I knew to be untrue, I knew there were problems on the wharf with old machinery, poor management, 
various things. All human organisations need improvement from time to time, right? But he was softening up the Australian public before he moved the mercenaries in to physically drag us off the wharves and lock us out. Similar strategy to Watsik. Watsik was doing some great work. Howard certainly never celebrated that. He amplified its problems. He didn't let us evolve that organisation with the review that was done. He didn't let the democracy run its course to weed out, as democracy does, poor leaders being chosen from time to time. Again, sold a lie to the public, softened them up, and then repealed it with the support of the Latham Labor opposition. We know that we need to, we need to do something different. We know we need a voice. Because when ATSIC was destroyed, what happened? Those protests that were, I was involved in, those sorts of harmful decisions. We saw the Northern Territory intervention that you guys know for all of the taxpayer expense took us backwards. It was harmful. It was unjust. And one of the reasons why the Uluru Statement from the Heart has the name Uluru is because the Uluru family want the power of Uluru to see this through to success because they were in the community that wore the brunt of the intervention in Mutatulu. So we know we must re-establish a voice because without a voice you're exploited, you're degraded, you're ignored. But we need to enshrine in the constitution, the rule book of the nation, to put it out of the reach of future hostile governments. The other thing it proposes is a Makarata commission to supervise the process of agreement making and truth telling to the nation but the focus right now is on the voice, because that makes sense. We cannot wait decades for a treaty to begin to, um, uh, to, to begin to get greater advocacy, greater outcomes in housing, in justice, in health, in education and employment, the issues that are common in all of our communities across the country. We must establish a voice to be able to do better in those spaces now. To wait an unknown amount of time for an unknown outcome in a treaty would not be doing our people um, the best representation that we can do. We did not take no for an answer. The Uluru Statement was dismissed almost immediately by Malcolm Turnbull and his government. And now we have a government that is committed to it and I believe that Albanese is as passionate as we were when we endorsed the statement. But the rest is going to be up to us, the Australian people. And this is more than a history lesson that I'm giving you. This is about action now. The referendum, as I said, will likely be mid-October. It gives us only around six months at best. And so I am here to give you this talk to ask you, with the information that I've given, with the common sense, the logic, the history behind it, to not just go out there and vote yes when the time comes, but to do the work as we did to influence all of your friends and your family and anyone else that you can to vote yes and to join this campaign. Thank you. feel like I was doing a union talk there to you guys and you're all a bit stunned. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, thanks Thomas. <laughs> that was um, uh, really great to hear, you know, the background to how it all came about, um, the Uluru statement and, you know, you, you've converted me, I'll join the union, <laughs> it's fine, I'm happy to do that. <laughs> Oh, look, the boss is looking at <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, You know, uh, it gave a really good um, overview, very briefly, albeit, of our struggle as people, that we've continually had to um, respond, be agile, change, respond. Um, we've had things that we've built up that have then been dismantled. Um, I think I remember things like, um, you know, the National Aboriginal Health Strategy, um, which is 
our founding sort of health document when people came together. Um, within that document, it even talks about, you know, our self-determination, um, having decision-making powers. Um, I think uh, the timing is really interesting around all of this uh, in the way that, um, you know, probably the last sort of biggest um, piece of, um, like the ATSIC Commission was probably our last biggest voice, wasn't it, um, in relation to having people come together. However, the difference is that this was not brought together by a government, but by people. Um, and so how, like who actually was the architects behind, you know, even just the impetus for this to occur? Because it was all quiet until it actually happened with those consultations. Well, a voice to parliament is something that has been, it's been called for, I mentioned those other statements and petitions, so I mentioned several. Um, the 1930s, the petition by, you know, William Cooper and the leaders of the time that they organised uh, a petition to the King. Uh, 1963, the Yakala Bark petitions, the Yolnu mob, you know, seeking to protect country from a mine that was, um, the federal government was moving to excise a massive portion of that land. Uh, the 1972 Larrakia petition to the Queen. And each of those statements and petitions um, called for a voice in different iterations. The, um, or, yeah, political representation. The Yolnu Yukala Bark petitions was calling for a parliamentary, uh, you know, committee and interface to talk to the Yolnu people's interests. Um, and so this is something that is, uh, uh, you know, it's like I use the unions as an example, right? But any group of humans, you know, whether it's a business council, whether it's an industry association, um, it just makes sense to form a structure and to speak collectively um, to, to be able to further your interests. So our people did the same thing, um, but they've always been silenced. Just another thing while I'm talking about the other statements and petitions, that was one of the lessons um, that we learnt that they were all dismissed and ignored. Probably the exception is the Barunga Statement, where ATSIC came from. Um, but uh, that's why the Uluru Statement, you would have heard, is addressed to the Australian people uh, and not to the parliament itself. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to open it up to the floor now um, to see if there's any questions from the audience before I continue to have a chat. Yeah, Steve. <coughs> Thanks. Thanks. Uh, a microphone. Thank you, Pete. Um, thanks for that fabulous talk, fabulous, and thanks for being here today. I guess um, we as healthcare researchers or health and medical researchers um, have uh, thought about how to um, support the voice, and, uh, and obviously that's an individual decision. It's not a decision for SAMRI or for an academy, but certainly the two organisations that I'm intimately involved with, which is SAMRI and the Academy of Health and Medical Science, have sought to support the voice in arguing that um, self-determination and a voice in health has been shown to improve health. We have tried and have collected examples of where that has um, been the situation. You know, Archos are a good example, but during COVID, another great example where the rate of COVID in Aboriginal communities was way lower than most other communities. And though that was um, led by Aboriginal people and they protected their own communities. Um, so I guess my, firstly, that's a bit of a statement, but secondly, in, in that is a question, is that do you think that's the best way that we as healthcare professionals and health medical researchers can support the voice? Is, is, that, a val is, is that useful and is that the best way? Yes, absolutely. Uh, your expertise and understanding of the evidence of uh, you know, self-determination leading to better results in health, um, getting that out there in any way you can um, is going to be very helpful. Uh, Fiona Stanley, my, my latest book written with Kerry O'Brien, um, the Voice to Parliament Handbook, all the details you need. Fiona Stanley and Marcia Langton have a piece in there that, that gives some of those examples. Um, and so uh, I, would con I would suggest that you as an organisation might um, seek to have uh, you know, things in the, in the media, like opinion pieces even from yourself, 
um, just encouraging people to support this because of the reasons that you know this will be um, uh, get better outcomes. I, I just want to also put the challenge to you, though, that um, uh, a decision to support this unequivocally for the yes, um, take up that challenge across you know the organisations, the academy. Uh, you're running out of time to do it, um, but I think it's important enough. Uh, I know you have a reconciliation commitment, you know, you have a wrap. Um, this is the greatest step that you could possibly take for reconciliation. This is, this. Uh, although some are making it a political issue, this should be beyond politics. Um, it should be without question that we should do this um, very modest step that we have invited Australians to take. Thanks, Thomas. I guess not to um, throw it into politics, but there is a lot of focus on um, how communities on the ground, the grassroots people, you know, will actually be able to have a voice, um, you know, have their voice heard in Parliament. Um, do you have any comments in regard to that? Yes, so um, a few weeks ago, after a, a lot of work since the Albanese government was elected, uh, we agreed, um, the referendum working group uh, agreed with the government on a set of words that will go in the constitution, the, the provision. Uh, and I'll begin with that. It's only around 90 words. It's a, as, as I said, it's a modest proposal uh, and it's not something that fundamentally changes our democracy. Um, but establishes two main things um, that the Uluru Statement calls for. Uh, basically, the words go in, in recognition of the First Peoples, and I'm paraphrasing here, there shall be an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. The voice may make representations to the parliament and executive government, and the Indigenous leadership had to stand our ground on that. We really insisted that the executive government be um, included in that. Because if we were just to give our advice to Parliament, you know, politically, the decisions have pretty much already been made by the time it gets to Parliament. And so our representatives need to be able to influence the shaping of policy um, from the earliest inceptions. And also locally, um, you know, we need to have that, uh, that's where the rubber hits the road. Um, and then the third uh, point is that um, the Parliament will decide all matters relating to the voice, including the composition, powers, functions and procedures of the voice. And so the main thing is that it guarantees that we have uh, recognition through a voice and we can make representations. And that's, that's what we are entrenching in the constitution. Not a right to veto, um, not a third chamber to parliament, not something that's gonna tie up the courts as um, you know, some conservative, uh, conservatives have been saying. Um, that, uh, former High Court Justices French um, uh, and Hain, um, Silk, uh, Brett Walker leading Australian Silk um, and constitutional expert, you know, the most respected in the country, uh, Professor Anne Toomey have said that this is a sound set of words that isn't going to tie up the government in, in the courts. Um, and so to go to the question though, after covering that technical bit, some of you might be interested in that. Um, but there are um, voice design principles. We know a lot of Australians and certainly a lot of our mob are interested in what is this voice going to look like? And Peter Dutton, you know, um, those that oppose this have been trying to confuse Australians by saying there's no detail out there. I've already covered the 90 words really, pretty simple provision and that is the detail of what we're voting on. The normal process in constitutional reform uh, and, and the way our constitution works is you set up the principle. And so those words set up the principle that we will have a voice and be able to make representations. But how many people are elected and where from and those processes need to be flexible. You can't put all of that in the constitution. And so those design principles give more shape to that though, understanding Australians are interested. Uh, they wanna be sure that this is gonna look, you know, like they think it should. Um, but also there's going to be a subsequent process for Indigenous communities after the referendum succeeds to, um, to design that model um, about how it works on the ground. Great, thank you. And I believe in South Australia we've 
um, taken the step <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to great lead the way. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, just um, any questions from the audience? Oh, Robin. Yes. Hi. This is Robin Clark for Flanders. Um, first, a positive statement. Um, I was in Nullumbi in November, and um, I was in one of the community stores, and I saw this children's book uh, about the Uluru statement from the heart, which was amazing. So we've ordered copies. So that's going to be my contribution. My grandchildren are going to be reading the Uluru statement from the heart, um, their bedtime stories, but it was beautiful. It was absolutely beautifully written as well. Um, but my question was for when we vote yes, when once it becomes part of the constitution, I understand the importance of the constitution, particularly acknowledging. Mm. Um, but what do you foresee the flow through the translation? I would use the word. How will that translate into positive outcomes for communities? That's the question I don't quite get. I, mm. I understand mm. the politics and the representation, yeah. but what are the good things that are going to happen as a consequence of this? Because I don't hear that articulated so clearly in the rhetoric. Yeah, thanks for that question. It's really the most important thing that we get outcomes, right? Um, and so the, the issues in our communities, the issues with our health um, and, and all those things, uh, everything is shaped by the decisions made in parliament, right? Um, the policies and laws matter. Where funding goes, you know, money matters. Um, the efficiency of how that money is spent and, and that it actually reaches the people that need it matters. And so the voice, just by political influence, right, one, and also um, uh, accountability that it brings. Uh, that is going to help shape those laws and policies so that they are, are better. And, and, you know, the, the evidence is there, as was mentioned, um, that that does make a, a tangible difference on the ground. Um, the accountability, the, the political and accountability part of it is that at the moment, and one of the reasons why I think every time we've established a voice that has made decision makers uncomfortable, they've gotten rid of it. Um, this is re-establishing a representative body for us where we can choose our own representatives, not a political party, not Thomas Mayo getting up and saying, hey, I can speak for all black fellas today. I'm speaking up because I want to establish the means for my mob to choose and hold our representatives to account. And in the absence of that, you know, it, it's, it's obviously failing us. Um, transparency. Uh, we don't see oftentimes what our people that say they speak for us are saying to ministers uh, and, and top bureaucrats, right? We're establishing this voice and one of the design principles is that it's transparent. And not only Indigenous people then see what our representatives are saying on our behalf and then through being able to choose our representatives, we can hold them to account, democratic processes, but all Australians can see then. And so when a parliament decides to ignore the advice that comes from the ground that has been worked through with our people through regular debate and discussion, um, then all, Austra and, and if that, leads to detrimental outcomes, then we'll see greater accountability um, because the Australian people have said through the referendum, we expect that what Indigenous people say is respected and acted on. Might be people online who also have a question, just type it into the Q&A section. Thank you very much. I will be honest, that's the first time I've heard the Uluru statement spoken so truly from the heart. So thank you, it was very powerful. Since we had a speaker last month, I've actually been encouraging conversation amongst family and friends about this topic. One of the things I'd like to know though, is for them to be able to educate themselves, where can I send them for resources to be able to be educated on this topic? Yes, so there's uh, a website, yes23.com.au, um, also ulurustatement.org, um, so they're, um, you know, there are a couple of websites with other inf more information. Also, if you want to go deeper into the referendum council process and the dialogues and the evidence that is there of, um, you know, how people reached priorities and what they were, um, the referendum council final report is still a really great document to have a look at. Um, 
Further, there on the NIAA website, um, there is the voice design coders, the, the design principles that I mentioned, um, and they're really great to get more information about the shape of the voice. Uh, and so they're great um, places to find resources. The books um, also that I've written, uh, the um, Finding the Heart of the Nation is the first book I wrote. Uh, it's for adults. Um, all of the author royalties go to the campaign, so it's not a personal profit thing, as is the, the latest book with Kerry O'Brien. 50% um, of the royalties go to the Indigenous Literacy Foundation. It'll only be useful until October, so I'm not going to make any money out of that either. That was a great question. Thank you. Kim. Hi. How are you going? Um, I just wanted to say thank you for all of those resources and we'll share them through um, the Samri community and through our network. Um, I was just thinking, Thomas, what if you had three kind of take home messages or three key points um, that would be the, you know, the most powerful kind of points to help educate people as a take home from today, what would they be? Well, yeah, firstly, I'd say keep it simple. Most people are actually not that worried about the detail. They'll need to hear from someone that they trust and that they love that this is the right thing to do and that it's not going to, you know, tear down our democracy. Um, just have those conversations, okay? Um, if they want to know more, then hopefully I've informed you and hopefully those resources will help you have those conversations. Um, Secondly, have those conversations uh, with people that you know interstate as well. Uh, Queensland and WA, if you've got family and friends in Queensland and WA, they're the states that we're struggling um, with the most. Um, but have, I don't want you to feel like this is impossible either. Uh, this is very difficult, of course. Uh, only eight out of 44 referenda have been successful. Um, but uh, this is, we're in a better position than the no campaign right now. Uh, more than 50% of Australians as a total um, in the polls have indicated consistently that they support this. Um, all of the states um, are um, above 50% except for those two states that I mentioned in the latest poll, um, but they're very close. The, the yes numbers are higher than the no numbers in those states though, the rest are undecided. Um, so please uh, make the effort and lastly, the reason to make the effort, and this might move some people, um, and it's not emotional blackmail as some people say, um, because the no case is using emotional blackmail by trying to scare Australians into voting no. Um, but the fact is that if we fail in this referendum, just think about how you'll feel the next morning and how you know, you'd feel uh, teaching children, your grandchildren about what happened this year, that Australia, collectively and officially has said no to recognising the existence of our proud Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture and heritage, and that they've said no to the decency of simply us having a say before decisions are made about us, saying no to the fair go. It would be devastating for our country. It will look, um, we would uh, go a long way back in our standing in the world as well. And worst of all, um, it's going to make matters worse in our communities and, and for our children's future. So we've got to fight for this. Well, we're not going to finish off on that note. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so, um, so what um, you've said, you know, we'll wake up, you know, feeling no good the next morning. Uh, what will it actually do in the lives of non-Indigenous people if they vote yes? Well, if you think about the Constitution, not just as a rule book, but what constitutes us as Australians, right? Um, the Uluru Statement from the Heart, uh, you know, I mean, really the, the generosity of it is that, and, and this ties into the research as well, the research shows that a majority of Indigenous people support this. There's been a number of polls the latest one was, a, was the largest ever, I think it was a YouGov poll, 83% um, of Indigenous people nationally support this. The research shows that the reason why a majority of Indigenous people support this, the strongest compelling reason, 
is because I see this as a unifying moment. Most of our people want this to be a unifying moment for our country. And if we think about the constitution as what constitutes us, you know, this is about sharing our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture is part of what we are, you know, who we are as Australians. Um, and further than that, it's, you know, we go from a young nation, which has always been false. Um, this is an old country. It's a, you know, the longest continuing civilization on the planet to a country that can um, say something truly unique about who we are. And that is that, um, that most uh, ancient and continuing culture on the planet. I'd just like to say thank you, Thomas. Thank you for joining us today and sharing this um, journey that many people have been on over a long period of time. And um, just thank everybody for being here this afternoon and hopefully, um, yeah, hopefully you, um, you, you can take something positive away from this and share this with your family and colleagues and friends. Annie Rods, did you? Yeah, I just wanted to, just some. It's just a, something that you mentioned. You mentioned William Cooper. And um, I just want to say that, you know, the voice has always been in our community. We, we, we've always had a voice. And um, I know that my grandfather, uh, Robert Wangani, he was one of those and with uh, Percy Rigney about the conditions of their community and um, wages and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, so I think Aboriginal people are very uh, resilient and um, and know what is best for their community. And, um, and it's great that uh, you shared a lot of that stuff with us because I know about that stuff. But do, you know, um, we talk about accountability, you know, and there's a lot of people in my community that are, they want to vote, yes, but like you said, the details, you know, and I think having those conversations is very, very important for our community. And we talk about transparency, you know, and um, so, you know, like, thank you for, because I, I mean, I've always been a yes person, but just hearing what you said today just really resonated and, and making me think, well, that's a conversation I need to have. But we have a lot of people in our community. Uh, I talk about how government is, is, is about divide and conquer, and even with our own community, with our own people, you know, and I think once we hopefully we get over the yes, you know, the campaign, because you know, this is like a grassroots um, campaign that we go in it to community. So, you know, I think we got a lot of strong people in our community that will have those conversations. And also, you know, we talk about building the pillars of reconciliation together, and this is a way that we can move forward. There's no excuse not to go forward, Arnie, eh? Yes. Thank you, Arnie. Thanks, Arnie Ross. Well, you've done it again. How about we end on that note um, with those um, words of wisdom and just, uh, again, examples of, um, you know, individuals in our community, families that have um, always been asking for a voice and for recognition. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Thank you, Adair. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Thomas.